Today is the feast day of St. Irenaeus, bishop and martyr. So let us begin with a prayer to St. Irenaeus. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. amen. O God, who called the bishop St. Irenaeus to confirm true doctrine in the peace of the church, grant, we pray, through his intercession, that being renewed in faith and charity, we may always be intent on fostering unity and concord. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. St. Irenaeus was one of the giants of the early church, one of the greatest fathers of the church. He was a second and third century bishop of Lyon. He, he was a disciple of St. Polycarp, who knew John. And so Irenaeus was born in 120 A.D., died, martyred in 202 A.D. But one of the beautiful things about being Catholic is our ancestry, our apostolic ancestry. We can go in our faith from the Apostle John to St. Polycarp, who was also martyred in Rome, who uh, guided St. Irenaeus, the Bishop of Lyon. And St. Irenaeus is known for many things, of course. One is fighting the Gnostic heretics of his time. He wrote a large work called Against the, the Heretics. Uh, he was one of the first people we have on record who identified the four books of, of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's one of the clues we have of those were the four books the, the early church felt accurately reflected what Jesus said and did. Without Irenaeus, we wouldn't know exactly how did we get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, and so many other things. Uh, in another document, he mentioned the preeminence of the Bishop of Rome in the early church as leader of the apostles and the apostolic succession. Interesting, already by the second century, early third century, there's momentum and indications coalescing around Rome and the Bishop of Rome. So I could go on and on. In fact, in Fathers of the Church 2014, uh, we devoted a class to Irenaeus, if you're interested in recalling that. So tonight, uh, we are on our schedule here uh, talking about Gaudium et Spes, joy and hope. So the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. And the titles of the documents in Latin always are calling out the first sentence, really, of the document. Gaudium et spes, the church shares the joys and hopes, anxieties and disappointments of the world. You don't want to put anxieties and disappointments as the title, though. <laughs> so, but before we begin uh, and jump into the document, I do have to point something out that an earthquake happened last week related to Roe v. Wade and abortion in the U.S. And I think we should acknowledge the 50 years of, of action and resistance and work that the pro-life movement did. And um, I think the explanation and quotes of why the church in this country has been rather quiet about it is the fear of vandalism and destruction. If we toot the horn too much, will we antagonize uh, the rabble uh, and the deviants even more? Uh, but I think we should call it out regardless. You never let your enemy frame how you respond and evangelize uh, the world. So that's an unfortunate position uh, the bishops take. Uh, one wonders if uh, another pet uh, theme was embraced that we would celebrate that more publicly. I would note that this decision came down on the feast day of the Sacred Heart on Friday, June 24th, which is a wonderful uh, memorial of a long battle. So with that, why don't we continue uh, into tonight's topic, Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World. So this document in many ways set a tone that lasted longer than what the document actually said. 
Uh, it set a tone of engagement with the secular world on a new footing, uh, a new posture, as I call it. Dialogue and proposals versus judgments and condemnations. Uh, and this style uh, or spirit is what some, in what I have called earlier the para council, which was an aberrant interpretation of the councils by dissatisfied theologians and others, use this style as the true meaning of Vatican II. And so the church was approaching the world with an open hand, uh, not a, a making judgments and anathemas. And nowhere is that more uh, crystallized in this document. John Paul II, St. John Paul II, was a bishop from Poland at the time, Archbishop of Krakow, and attended Vatican II and was highly influential on this document in a particular way. Namely, that the world and everything in it has a Christocentric orientation. And we'll develop this a little bit more, but this, for John Paul II, was fundamental to his evangelization in Eastern Europe. I put here something that actually Cardinal Ratzinger wrote much later, that the ambitions of the document uh, display what he called an astonishing optimism about this dialogue with the world, that it would actually be a two-way dialogue. Uh, and it turned out really not to be. The church listened and the world spoke. <laughs> uh, and so this inversion, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger noted, and and even at the time, not just later as a cardinal archbishop, was somewhat perplexed at how optimistic the church envisioned this dialogue with the world. And as we know, uh, that dialogue has been one-sided and has not gone well, to say the least. But nevertheless, at the time, the church was saying, and its ambition really was to be a universal church again. So no longer just a European church dealing with Euro Western European squabbles uh, versus Protestantism or the Enlightenment, but the tone of this document truly is to reclaim the church as the universal church, uh, which is, a, again, a change in style. Uh, but continuing, uh, the document itself has these section headers. You can see the scope of this is immense. Uh, if you just go through these, you know, the dignity of the human person, the community of mankind, man's activity throughout the whole world, the role of the church in the modern world, and then specific problems uh, around marriage and family, how culture should develop, economic and social life, where the social teachings of the Catholic Church are enunciated all in one place, and that would later be developed uh, by John Paul II in his pontificate the life of the political community, fostering peace and the promotion of the whole community of nations, a, a, a significant endorsement of global bodies, entities, like the United Nations that formed in 1948, uh, were very much endorsed by Vatican II at the time. Coming out of World War II, uh, the church was highly interested in making sure nations were organized in a way that could prevent another global conflict like that. And so, you look at the scope of this document, and it's the longest document of Vatican II. Uh, it's immense. And uh, other than the social teaching of the Catholic Church, and one of the key principles that I, I will develop later that John Paul II immediately jumped on in his papacy, much of this is a bit shop-worn. And uh, what I mean by that is, as it, you know, the, this constitution contains certain doctrinal elements that we would all assent to, but the observations from 1965, you can't blame the church that those, those observations almost 60 years later are a little out of date. And so the principles enunciated in the document are much more important than the specific granular proposals here often, like about the United Nations, or other things uh, in the political order uh, are contingent in many ways. Think of the U.S. Bishop's pastoral letter on the economy in 1983. Can anyone remember anything about that? 
No. It, 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 it's gone to much deserved oblivion. So, um, <laughs> so what's the shift in perspective? The shift in perspective is the leadership style of the church, the broader world in the 19th century was hostile and isolationist. And I've said this a few times in the other classes. Whether it was the Protestant revolts of the 16th century, the rise of the Enlightenment and reason disconnected from God or a transcendent order or the natural law, but rather reason is more concerned with the development of science and technology, making stuff that improves our lives. Uh, but beyond that, reason can't know anything. So the Enlightenment project of let's achieve scientific knowledge, which won't have room for using God as an explanation of anything. And, or think of politically, you know, the 19th century is considered the long century in history books, starting with the French Revolution in the late 1780s and 90s, all the way through to World War I, because what you had was a significant regrouping in Europe. Think of the, the key moments in the 19th century, whether it was the Treaty of Paris in 1815, this kind of nervous you know, assembly of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, the Prussian Empire, Italy, France, you know, are we gonna play nice? Uh, all the way to the revolutions of 1848, nearly every major European city was a city of barricades for days, weeks, or months as revolutionaries republicanism, fighting absolute, uh, absolutists or royal uh, aristocracies. It, it ravaged Europe uh, and continued, frankly. And then there'd be overreach by the revolutionaries and they'd get crushed because they were divided amongst themselves. Or think of all the, the ethnic rivalries that were occurring in Eastern Europe, uh, Croats, Bosnians, Slovenians, not wanting to be under the Hungarians, who didn't want to be under the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. All this was simmering with uncertain resolutions uh, and unsteady pieces. The church, you know, the Pope was kicked out of Rome uh, in the 1840s and 50s. He had to flee again. So one Pope died under Napoleon, and then Another pope had to flee, Pius IX, Pio Nono, as he's called. <coughs> so um, this is the environment that the church was in. And that's why it was defending itself and hostile and anathemas. And if you believe this, you're out. And uh, the pope still had troops in the 1850s fighting battles for him. So this was the environment. And the church finally caught its breath by Vatican II and was trying to reorient itself to the world and say, look, <laughs> can, we, can we just tell you about what we'd like to accomplish for a change <laughs> instead of trying to fight everyone all the time? The church didn't always figure well in the early 20th century either because it could never develop a true theological position on politics. Uh, and so in fighting communism, it aligned perhaps too closely with fascism in Spain, in Italy, in Germany. Uh, and there was not maybe enough clear vocal separation because the church was still trying to survive. And so this is the posture of this document. This is the posture of Vatican II as a whole. Uh, and so th what the church had noted correctly in the 18th and 19th and into the 20th century was society was adrift, obviously, with all of the conflicts. And that it had lost its theocentric center its center on God and the dignity of man. And so major Christian countries had embraced communism or national socialism, all left-wing secular ideologies that dethrone God and uh, reduce the dignity of man to a broader narrative, a totalizing narrative that man is just a means in. And so this is what the church is trying to combat and get back to. So this document is this effort to revitalize the, evangelation, the evangelization of the church to the modern world and out of the mode that it had been in, frankly, for 400 years. As I mentioned, from judgments to proposals. 
Uh, you can even see, in spite of the church leadership, that many lay apostolates began to emerge in the 19th and 20th century. In this country, and in France and Italy, in this country, it was the Catholic uh, Family Movement, or the Cana Movement, associated with it. Dorothy Day, the Catholic Workers Movement, the Holy Name Societies, uh, Catholic Action, and so forth. There was almost a sense among the laity that we need to evangelize the world, even if our church is not going to. <laughs> And so this was starting uh, almost as a, a, uh, an adjustment, the way uh, you know, the human body adjusts to an injury. Um, and so the, the issue, though, is in hindsight, uh, what Vatican II launched was this dialogue with the world just at the time when the world was going to slap the hand back at the church. And so what resulted, as we can see in looking back, as I call these tsunamis that keep rolling in and destroying civilization in the West, uh, was too much foggy dialogue with the world and not enough clarity about what is the church proposing, in fact. So too much listening and not enough uh, clarifications, as I put it here. Now part of this is just the rate of change that has occurred in the 20th century and even into our time. And as Pope Benedict uh, and as Cardinal Ratzinger observed, these changes, technological, political, economical, uh, have proceeded at a pace that's much faster than our ability to, th to think about them from an ethical or spiritual point of view. It's happening so fast that the human is being uh, ignored or squelched or even attacked. And so let me... Uh, give a quote first from Gaudium et Spes, the Vatican II document, and then how uh, Cardinal Ratzinger enlarged on this. So even at the beginning of the Vatican document, uh, quote, moreover, man is becoming aware that it is his responsibility to guide or right the forces which he has unleashed and, and which can enslave him or minister to him. This is an ominous warning that in 1965 uh, we were just tiptoeing really uh, in front of what was about to happen in the West in particular. Now see how uh, in 2006 Cardinal Ratzinger talks about this. Less visible but not for that reason less disturbing are the possibilities of self-manipulation that man has acquired. He has investigated the farthest recesses of his being. He has deciphered the component of the human being, DNA. And now he is able, so to speak, to construct man on his own. Think of the CRISPR technology for gene splicing as an example. This means that man enters the world no longer as a gift of the creator, but as the product of our activity. In this way, the splendor of the fact that he is the image of God the source of his dignity and of his inviolability, no longer shines upon this man. His only splendor is the power of human capabilities. Man is nothing more now than the image of man. And so with the rise of what I'll call cultural atheism, cultural Marxism, secular progressivism, and nihilism, which we'll explore a bit, you see the dethroning of God actually also results in the debasement of man. Man's true stature and dignity are rooted in God. We all have an eternal origin, God, and we all have an eternal destiny, God, something transcendent, something eternal. When that becomes knocked aside, we become very horizontal in our thinking. All of a sudden, the dignity of the person is a bit up for grabs or a means to a larger political program. There is no inherent dignity as such in the individual. The individual doesn't have inestimable infinite value, but rather uh, physical value, material value, usually self-designated value, provided you have the power. Uh, and so Gaudium et Spes acknowledges this creeping atheism. How could it not? The 20th century was littered with it. Uh, but the tone is reserved. 
about the critique of atheism. So let's take a look at how you see the tone is different. You contrast this tone with, with the popes of the 19th century who condemned atheism root and branch. Uh, here, let's see how Gaudium at Spes in paragraph 21 describes it. In her loyal devotion to God and men, the church has already repudiated and cannot cease repudiating sorrowfully but as firmly as possible those poisonous doctrines and actions which contradict reason and the common experience of humanity and dethrone man from his native excellence. Still she strives to detect in the atheistic mind the hidden causes for the denial of God, conscious of how weighty are the questions which atheism raises and motivated by love for all men, she believes these questions ought to be examined seriously and more profoundly. We certainly cannot disagree with that sentiment. It's an even-handed statement, but uh, the exploration of it tends to end and show this balance, uh, this, this almost tiptoeing through the graveyard, so to speak, of what will be coming in our time in particular. So now we get to Gaudium et Spes number 22, paragraph 22, which is the, uh, in the opinion of John Paul II, uh, the statement of this document, the one that you should not forget. <laughs> and I think we can all agree with him. Quote, the truth is that only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take on light. For Adam, the first man, was a figure of him who was to come, namely Christ the Lord. Christ, the final Adam, by the revelation of the mystery of the Father and his love, fully reveals man to himself and makes his supreme calling clear. It is not surprising, then, that in him all the aforementioned truths find their root and attain their crown. He who is the image of the invisible God is himself the perfect man. To the sons of Adam, he restores the divine likeness which has been disfigured from the first sin onward. Since human nature, as he assumed it, was not annulled, by that very fact it has been raised up to a divine dignity in our respect too. For by his incarnation, the Son of God has united himself in some fashion with every man. He worked with human hands. He thought with a human mind, acted by human choice, and loved with a human heart. Born of the Virgin Mary, he has truly been made one of us, like us in all things except sin. This is a very bold statement. Uh, it, it speaks to, as I put here at the bottom bullet, the Christocentric nature of all reality, including man. Not just in the order of grace, but in some sense, this cosmic Christ. That he is present in a mysterious way to all people in all times and places. And this is a, a tremendous statement, as I put it, big and radical. And, and we're apt to miss just how bold uh, this statement is, which we'll, we'll try to uh, develop a little bit more later. So if we were to summarize what has happened coming out of Gaudium et Spes, we, we must embrace the hopeful words that I just read, that Christ is the center of reality. He's not just a devotional figure. He's not simply the infant of Prague, though he is that. He is this Christo you know, for all, for all people, all races, all times and places. As I mentioned here, that message has been very appealing in Africa and in Asia, where in Africa in particular, the church has grown tremendously. What we've seen in the West, where we live, is decadence and decline. And as I put it, the rear guard action of trying to save what we can uh, of amidst this decline in our time. What we're gonna turn to now is and don't worry, we'll get hopeful at the end, uh, is the rise of this aggressive, toxic, cultural atheism and nihilism. 
to to talk about evangelization evangelization without talking about this is a bit like talking about what your diet should be without talking about your underlying diabetes or high blood pressure. You're just not going to be helpful and you're not going to be, your proposals will not be realistic if you don't know what you're fighting. Uh, and so this, as I put it, has caught the church flat-footed. Certainly since 1965 to the present, the church in its leadership uh, and in other areas uh, in some ways has been operating like it's still 1955. Uh, think of, in this country, uh, the, the leash that Catholic politicians who have promoted positions at variance with the church's teaching in public consistently, uh, nothing has happened to them by and large for 50 years. Uh, so this has metastasized for 50, 60 years, much more quickly than anyone could have anticipated in 1965. And so let's, and we've done this in past classes in 2018, in 2019, and earlier, but let's look again briefly at two significant thinkers, Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche. What's interesting about cultural Marxism today is what could not be achieved in two world wars, we are now handing over freely. <laughs> but let's, let's look at that as we go. So Marx is a 19th century political philosopher. And the tagline quote that he's known for, among others, is philosophy or philosophers have only in interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. So his theorizing is about social and political action and serve of certain ends and purposes. The key salvation he is offering is the alienation of man in his economic life. He, he casually dismisses uh, the ideas of religion and the transcendent as not the true categories of human existence. Economic man and class will predict what you believe, will predict the kind of music you like, and there's certain appealing aspects of this uh, to explain things, but his frame of reference is to address this alienation with the rise of the Industrial Revolution, with the growth of populations in major urban centers in Europe, with the revolutionary fomenting that was going on, even without Karl Marx's philosophy, as I mentioned earlier. His, his Garden of Eden story was the French Revolution. He wanted that throughout all of Europe. The enthronement of <coughs> science and materialism and the dethronement of religion, God, clergy. Uh, even though he didn't say it, the French revolutionaries said that they wanted the last king to be strangled by the entrails of the last priest. And so this is the orientation that Marx is coming out of, influenced by other German philosophers who were materialists and atheists. Man makes religion for comforts. So this alienation of economic man from his work uh, requires negation, cancelization of bourgeois values in society based on class so that man can achieve his true value overcome alienation in a classless society. So you've heard of the dictatorship of the proletariat, which is the mechanism by which history advances to scrub away, through violence, classes, to make the ownership of property common, although it never really is common. Um, and uh, this labor capital divide, which is spoken of, is, becomes a Marxist construct. Uh, and so we move through these various stages of history that is inevitable, the arc of history, capital H, leading to the communist state. What's going on here? Every philosophy has to have a buck stops here part of it. What Marx does is he relocates the transcendence and absolute truth of God into history 
that is working itself out to achieve a communist revolution that destroys class-based society, creates common ownership of property. So he's not really theorizing. He, he is saying that's the template. Your ideas are worthless and probably ideological. The template is that. That is the fundamental claim. He's not going to debate that. That's like debating whether water is wet. That is the pace of history. And so that's what Marx is up to. And as, as uh, there's an Italian uh, former Marxist who became uh, a significant historian and philosopher of Marxism uh, in the crisis of modernity, says that Marx seeks to realize a totality, a grand narrative or totality in history, not, not there in the sky, God, or whatever that means. Of course, in practice, this crumbled rather quickly. So with Lenin, he said, why wait for history? <laughs> <laughs> and and with, with Stalin later, you kind of had this Cesaro, uh, we move from party to me. So Lenin moved from history to the party. Stalin moved from the party to himself. Uh, you can read about that uh, in other works on the history of communism. But what this unleash, unleashed is this movement of history to negate bourgeois Judeo-Christian values. That template is out there now in the bloodstream and in history. So um, I've said this before, and, and philosophers who read this closely, has, Marxism is the last gasp of the Enlightenment. You, you might be, well, wait a minute, I thought Marxism was about military parades and, and you know <laughs> things like that. Um, but Marxism is the last Western, major Western philosophy that attempts to create a scientific objective standpoint. We think we're right. This isn't just uh, some class in you know, an Ivy League school on comparative religion. We are it, capital H. You are either part of history, part of the revolution, or you're antisocial. Those are your choices. So it's the last gasp of the Enlightenment project was the attempt to establish norms and truths of morality and science apart from their Judeo-Christian foundation. That's the Enlightenment project. It has failed. It has collapsed into Marxism, which all that Marxism and communism have produced are, in the 20th century, as I put it, massive graveyards uh, and famines. Uh, and so uh, that has collapsed. And as I mentioned here, as just a side note, and you can look at this in the history of, of mass movements that become destructive, uh, they always start out with uh, appeals to the masses that are attractive to them. I mentioned one of them being Luther's revolt, uh, appeal to the masses, and then the peasants' revolt of, I think it was 1521. All of a sudden, they started tearing things apart and attacking what the princes owned. And the princess said to Luther, uh, no. And so Luther immediately said, okay, I'm with you guys. And they put down and killed thousands and thousands of peasants. And so mass movements like this always tend to eventually go to the elites. You know, in, in Luther's case, the German princes propped him up. Uh, and with Russian communism, the party propped it up. Uh, and again, there's many examples of this we could talk about. How, this still has a toehold in our consciousness, though, and it, with our global elites. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because I, I want to refer you to the sources rather than just you taking my word for it. But in my opinion, uh, the alarmist aspect of the global warming movement is an example of this cultural Marxism, this seeking for a grand narrative by which you can control the masses. Now, the claim of writers that I uh, respect and ring true to me don't deny that the globe is warming. It is warming based upon the satellite data, which they can't tinker with, unlike uh, land-based thermometers, which they have tinkered with. Uh, and there's other proxy data that show, that are ground-based, that show a warming planet in the 20th and 21st century. So to dispute that, you're on thin ice, no pun intended. The issue these thinkers raise is the alarmist aspect of it, 
that we must do something now or we will die. The apocalyptic language, the we must get off fossil fuels or else. Uh, that's, that has this odd controlling, uh, as I call it, muscle memory of Marxism to it. And if you read these sources, so Steve Koonin, who's an astrophysicist from Caltech, served under the Obama administration, so not a, uh, a reader of the Wanderer. Um, <laughs> he was a, a, an advisor to the UN uh, panel on climate change. His book, Unsettled, initially wasn't going to be published on Amazon. <laughs> Because here's a scientist saying, here's what we know. Here's what the cu computer models are capable of showing. It's a very interesting book, and I urge you or anyone listening to this to go get it and read it. Bjorn Lomberg, a, generally speaking, a liberal, also talks about this alarmist response to the data that we're seeing. Uh, why are we doing this? It's irrational. If we cared about humanity, we'd actually spend more time on the third world in particular, uh, you know, getting base medications to people in those villages. Many of them are still dying from 19th century diseases like malaria. How about, you know, spending money on malaria pills for children in Africa? Uh, or Patrick Moore, an interesting figure, a co-founder of Greenpeace. For him, Greenpeace meant being concerned about the environment and peace with humanity. And he started out by trying to protect whales and against nuclear weapons. And he noted that after a while, after the Sandinistas fell in Nicaragua and brought it and the communists failed with the wall coming down in Eastern Europe and Germany, that all of a sudden all these communists started flowing into the green movement. And he said they, had, they didn't know anything about earth science that used to be studied. Uh, they knew nothing about uh, energy. Uh, they just saw a useful lever by which you can deindustrialize and destroy the West. So there's books written on this called uh, Watermelon, Green on the Outside, Red on the Inside. I, I mean, the literature is there. If you want to read it, don't take my word for it. And it stands on the merits of its arguments and the data it cites. But I would defy you, if you read Steve Coonan Unsettled, or other books like Michael Schellenberger, uh, a, a wonderful advocate for the poor in the third world. He's running for governor in California. He's a liberal. Again, he talks about this alarmist. So my point is that cultural Marxism is not gone, and it survives in these global totalizing narratives. Uh, we won't even talk about how the church has uh, responded to this either. Uh, otherwise, we might be canceled. So, um, the other uh, gentleman uh, we'll look at is Frederick Nietzsche, another 19th century uh, philosopher. He had a much deeper understanding of human nature. You know, in truth, Karl Marx kind of reminds me of, of the 16-year-old the in his basement, you know, online, with like five snicker bars and a, a large grape knee-high. And, 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 uh, but Nietzsche had a much deeper grasp of the consequences of the dethronement of God and the Judeo-Christian ethos. And as a result, he's actually our enduring philosophy of life in our culture today. So Marxism is, is tired. It's, it's, you know, the Davos crowd, you notice they're all, you know, older. Uh, your, your mega billionaires tend to be the ones interested in that, the, the old money, so to speak. Uh, but Nietzsche is the one that really has everyone's heart and soul in our culture. And for Nietzsche, the problem with Christianity and bourgeois values in general, much of which we would agree with him, by the way, uh, in his critique, but it's making the relative truth absolute. The relative truth, the claims of Christianity have created this, what I call uh, enslavement of man, a slave mentality he'll talk about. We're, we're giving our sovereignty to that which is relative. What's absolute is my autonomy, my choice, my ability to will, my life project. When I hand that over to something outside of me, something that's inhuman, uh, I'm a slave. I'm dehumanizing myself. And so, as I put it here, 
uh, it's the absolute liberation of man is the fundamental standpoint. It's unclear what Nietzsche knew of Marx. Uh, Marx obviously didn't know much, if anything, at all about Nietzsche. Uh, but they both are attacking bourgeois values, but for different reasons. Marx thinks he can prop up a scientific materialism enacted in history. Nietzsche is like, stop it. Get me a sandwich. Uh, and so uh, this is the true slave mentality that Nietzsche is talking about. Giving yourself over to some grand narrative that's, are you serious? Uh, and so this quote from the gay science, sometimes translated the joyful science, uh, sooner remain in debt than pay with a coin that does not bear our own portrait. That is what our sovereignty demands. So coinage typically had emperors and kings on them. That's not the currency of the human. The currency of the human is me, my sheer act of choice. And so, as I say here at the bottom, and this is his popular slogan, will to power, everything else that makes the relative absolute is will to power, enslavement. So, continuing, as I mentioned, Nietzsche's nihilism, or nihilism, which means nothing in Latin, it's the negation of all value, uh, is the dominant pulse within this receding, decaying Marxist framework. Uh, you know, if the alarmist global warming movement didn't exist, the global elites would have to invent it. Uh, and so uh, they have. And so uh, the traditional values, complete with their absolutisms, are attack on the freedom to be me. My sheer act of willing is the furnace. Everything else is thrown in. Everything else outside of me is the raw material by which my furnace can feed, manipulate, use for my purposes and ends. You know, Augustine, who Nietzsche appreciated, obviously he felt he ultimately failed, but wrote in his confessions during, prior to his conversion, that part of the attractiveness of sin is that delicious experience of the sheer act of willing. Untethered, unmoored, no restraint. There's a certain power reminiscent of the Garden of Eden that, that the lawlessness in choice is thrilling. And so with everything negated, canceled, uh, overcome, what's left is where we are today. This blank, horizonless autonomy is my real center. I construct my life project. Don't come at me with, with rules and laws from the outside. Uh, I am this real center, this grand autonomy, so-called. David Bentley Hart is an author, very polemical, very entertaining, wrote a book called Atheist Delusions. He's, he's gone off the rails a little bit of late with his, some of his latter books, for example, on the afterlife, but uh, this work is, is fascinating, and I'll quote you a passage from it. Modernity's highest idea, its special understanding of personal autonomy, requires us to place our trust in an original absence underlying all of reality, a fertile void. This is the nihilism that is liberating for young people, for example, in which all things are possible, from which arises no impediment to our wills and before which we may consequently choose to make of ourselves what we choose. We trust that is to say that there's no substantial criterion by which to judge our choices that stands higher than the unquestioned good of free choice itself, and that thereupon all judgment, divine no less than human, is in some sense an infringement upon our freedom. This is our primal ideology. In the most unadorned terms possible, the ethos of modernity is, to be perfectly precise, nihilism. 
And as I mentioned here again as a sub-bullet, Marxism has been subject to its own critique. It has been canceled, except in these global movements that are hanging on for dear life. So total narratives are out of fashion in a nihilism of Nietzsche. And so, as I mentioned, we're left with the Marxist muscle memory of class conflicts or other conflicts that have been fomented in our time. Uh, so the demand, as I put here as an example, not original with me necessarily, but the demand for racism in this country outstrips its supply. We're not a racist country. So you have to foment and create racism, true or imagined, in order to uh, achieve purposes that you have as a elite. Uh, it could be purchasing a home in Los Angeles with the proceeds from contributions to Black Lives Matter. Uh, it could be many other things, but there is a clear ideological and financial interest in fomenting class and race conflict in this country. People cash in. Some politicians base their entire career on this, and other activists. So this is the memory, the muscle memory that we still have in our society. So this, what I call toxic brew, and I think we're coming to the end of this, so don't worry, uh, uh, is what generates our decadence, what generates our decline. So when I mention here at the bottom, particularly the young, this is the group in our culture, in our society, that are naturally the most idealistic. They're most interested in giving themselves over to causes. And uh, when the goals and purposes that are put before them by their parents and other people who influence them are Netflix and selfies, they're naturally going to careen and stagger into pessimistic modes of action and destructive modes of action. Uh, and uh, we covered this last year, unfortunately, but the suicide rate among the young below 25 continues to rise, and I believe in some age groups, it's the second leading cause of death. Uh, and we covered that data last year. And this is, a, this is a verdict on what society is offering the young. Nihilism is soul-crushing, dark, grim, pointless uh, and ugly. And as I mentioned here, and we see it all the time in our country and other places, there's this, m this movement for the greater atrocity to create a buzz uh, and a, a, a semblance of meaning or permanence. I, I think the best expression of this is in a work by G.K. Chesterton written over 100 years ago. If you're familiar with G.K. Chesterton, uh, you know what I'm talking about. If you've never heard of him, you might enjoy several of his books um, as well. But I sense many of you have heard of him from the giggling. Uh, but let me read this to you from the book Everlasting Man. Quote, try that experiment of seeing history from the inside. There comes an hour in the afternoon when the child is tired of pretending, when he is weary of being a robber or a red Indian. It is then that he torments the cat. There comes a time in the routine of an ordered civilization when the man is tired of playing at mythology and pretending that a tree is a maiden or that the moon made love to a man. The effect of staleness is the same everywhere. It is seen in all drug taking and dram drinking and every form of the tendency to increase the dose. Men seek stranger sins or more startling obscenities as stimulants to their jaded sense. They seek after mad oriental religions for the same reason. They try to stab their nerves to life if it were with the knives of the priests of Baal. They are walking in their sleep, and they try to wake themselves up with nightmares. You know, the negation of nihilism and Marxism is really the essence of the diabolic. Uh, when you think about it, the destruction of natural unities, God and creation, man and woman, love and life and marriage, all of these destructions of you know, children with parents uh, are tearing apart 
what God intended to be created together. And the etymology of diabolic is actually interesting. It's a Greek word that is a combination of, of a part and a Greek verb balain meaning uh, to throw. It's where our word ballistic comes from. Uh, and something that shoots out. And so dia balain means to tear apart. And the essence of the diabolic is to tear apart these natural unities that exist in creation that are revelatory of God's design and eternal law. The essence of the diabolic in the Gospels was the devil trying to tear apart Jesus from the cross. We want a divine Jesus, but not a suffering Jesus. We want a humane Jesus, but we don't want the discipline. And so the essence of the diabolic is the tearing asunder of unity. And we have a companion word in English too, symbolic. That which is spoken together, put together. The symbol of faith are the statements of faith. Jesus is God and man. God is three persons in one nature. These symbola, these throw-togethers, are expressions of faith, expressions of truth, predication, putting together things. And so this is the corrective to the diabolic. And so this is what Chesterton is talking about, this tearing asunder in our time is the only thing that props these people up from not killing themselves. All right, now we get to the hope. So I brought you down. <laughs> no. <laughs> but we're talking about the church in the modern world, and this is the world we're living in at the moment. But it's not the only aspect of the world we're living in at the moment. The fact that it doesn't work, the fact that nihilism does not work, that it makes people unhappy, that it makes young people kill themselves, that it ruins society, that it destroys our common brotherhood and sisterhood under God, is a sign that it's an opening for our evangelization, our good example, and what we believe. If everything was going great guns under a godless existence, we kind of have to scratch our heads a bit. Uh, the fact that it doesn't work it leads to profound unhappiness is our opening and frankly the source of all real hope which we will now uh, unfold. Recall that passage from Gaudium at Spes number 22 where Christ reveals the mystery of man to himself. You know Jesus Christ is that love and truth. We've spent many classes talking that Jesus is not a proposition he is not a theology. He is a person who entered history, Jesus of Nazareth. And so embracing that person and that hope, uh, that, dare I say it, that dogma of our faith is actually the true liberation, the true way out of the dilemma of being human. Again, quoting G.K. Chesterton again in this confrontation with the nihilists, the skeptics, the materialists, quote, what the denouncer of dogma really means is not that dogma is bad, but rather that dogma is too good to be true. That is, he means that dogma is too liberal to be likely. Dogma gives man too much freedom when it permits him to fall. Dogma gives God too much freedom when it permits him to die. The intelligent skeptics mean that the universe is itself a prison, that existence itself is a limitation and a control. And it is not for nothing that they call causation a chain. In a word, they mean quite simply that they cannot believe these things, not in the least that they are unworthy of belief. We say not lightly but very literally that the truth has made us free. They say that it makes us so free that it cannot be the truth. To them it is like believing in fairyland to believe in such freedom as we enjoy. It is like believing in men with wings to entertain the fancy of men with wills. It is like accepting a fable about a squirrel in conversation 
with a mountain, to believe in a man who is free to ask or a God who is free to answer. This skeptical, skeptical position is a manly and rational negation for which I, for one, shall always show respect. Chesterton came from this movement. But I decline to show any respect for those who, first of all, clip the wings and cage the squirrel, rivet the chains and refuse the freedom, close all the doors of the cosmic prison on us with the clang of eternal iron, tell us that our emancipation is a dream and our dungeon a necessity, and then calmly turn around and tell us they have the freer thought and a more liberal theology. Isn't that wonderful writing? <laughs> Nihilism, this promise of freedom and autonomy, turns out to be in the style of the devil, you give me everything and you get nothing. Nothing. Because in truth, dogma is a bridge. Think of it as a pedestal to stand on. You see farther. Think of it as a telescope. You see farther in in more detail. So dogma is not only uh, liberating, but best of all, it leads us to a person. So when you want to get a line on a pope when they first start, their first encyclical is very revealing about where their heart and mind truly is. This was the first encyclical of John Paul II, Redemptor Homines, Redeemer of Man. And in it, right proceeding out of Vatican II and Gaudium et Spes, number 22, is the heart of this encyclical. The Redeemer of, this is the opening. The Redeemer of man, Jesus Christ, is the center of the universe and of history. To him go my thoughts and my heart in this solemn moment of the world that the church and the whole family of present day humanity are now living. The Redeemer of the world, exclaim, in him has been revealed in a new and more wonderful way the fundamental truth concerning creation to which the book of Genesis gives witness when it repeats several times, God saw that it was good. The good has its source in wisdom and love, not in negation. In Jesus Christ, the visible world which God created for man, that the world when sin entered was subjected to futility, recovers again its original link with the divine source of wisdom and love. Indeed, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. As this link was broken in the man Adam, so in the man Christ it was reforged. Are we of the 20th century not convinced of the overpoweringly eloquent words of the apostle of the Gentiles, St. Paul, concerning the creation that has been groaning in Travai together until now and waits with eager longing for the revelation of the sons of God? The creation that was subjected to futility, does not the previously unknown immense progress which has taken place, especially in the course of this century in the field of man's dominion over the world itself, reveal to a previously unknown degree that manifold subjection to futility. He's recalling the same theme that Cardinal Ratzinger talked about of the more we advance technologically, the more we're futile, subject to futility. And that only Jesus Christ, the redeemer of man, who reveals man to himself, is the way out of the predicament. Continuing, in its penetrating analysis of the modern world, the Second Vatican Council reached that most important point of the visible world, that is man. By penetrating like Christ, like the depth of human consciousness, and by making contact with the inward mystery of man, which in biblical and non-biblical language is expressed by the word heart. Christ, the Redeemer of the world, is the one who penetrated in a unique, unrepeatable way into the mystery of man and entered his heart. Rightly, therefore, does the Second Vatican Council teach, the truth is that only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take on light. For Adam, the first man, was a type of him who was to come, Christ the Lord. Christ, the new Adam, in the very revelation of the mystery of the Father and of his love, fully reveals man to himself and brings to light his most high calling. And the council continues, he who is the image of the invisible God is himself the perfect man 
who has restored in the children of Adam that likeness to God which has been disfigured ever since the, the first sin. And in closing, human nature by the very fact that it was assumed, not absorbed, in him has been raised in us also to a dignity beyond compare. For by his incarnation, he, the Son of God, in a certain way united himself with each man. He worked with human hands. He thought with a human mind. He acted with a human will and with a human heart he loved. Born of the Virgin Mary, he has been truly made one of us, like to us in all things except sin. He, the Redeemer of man. A very powerful statement of the heart of Pope John Paul II, now Saint John Paul II, and our core starting point of evangelizing atheistic culture that we live in. We start with a person, Jesus Christ. So we embrace this depth and optimism from John Paul II, which is tremendous and inspiring. The centrality of Jesus Christ. John Paul recalls this, uh, what I call, original wonder that the apostles had. Think of observing the miracles Jesus performed, conquering this world, raising Lazarus, the ultimate miracle of his death and resurrection. The apostles saw the risen Jesus. They, they must have had this wonder, this awe of Jesus Christ is truly the Lord and Savior of the universe. He assumed our condition fully, except for sin. He, and, and I'm, these are my words, but he furnishes the blueprint of what it means to be human. The cosmos, the universe, is engineered, configured in Christ. It's Christocentric. Remember the beginning of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, which is the base word in Greek for all our terms about rationality, both in philosophy, in science. All the disciplines have ology in them. Christ is there in every scientific discipline, in every study of the world, and in the human person, in their consciousness, in their soul. To put a, a, a more specific shine on this, this is beyond talk about devotion or even the order of religion. This is what is so radical about Vatican II. We're not even talking religiously at this moment. We're t I'm talking, following the footsteps of John Paul II, that Christ is the origin of the universe. It has a Christocentric foundation. Imagine the possibilities this now opens for evangelization. This is what the proposal of the church to the modern world consists of. It was continued in Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI. Key interpreters of Vatican II, they were there. It is our hope, it is the hope of mankind, it is our faith, and as we say in the ritual of baptism for the RCIA candidates, we are proud to profess it. So with that, we have time now, because I've done all the talking, uh, for comments or questions about what I've covered. So I, I took you down, I brought you back up. So Marcy, you, you can feel good now. <laughs> you look, you look. I thought you might be a little troubled. But the good question news in the back. The, the lives of the saints give us many examples of what to do, and you could start with the spiritual and corporal works of mercy a, as an example. Uh, you obviously uh, active participation in the liturgy of the church, uh, Eucharistic devotion, uh, various other devotions, but you combine that with whatever your state in life is. Uh, you're not married with six kids, so you, the answer wouldn't be, well, be a better father. No. So uh, whatever your state in life is, working out the virtues, the theological virtues and the other virtues, uh, and these spiritual and corporal works of mercy, uh, 
give life to what we believe and also assist in evangelizing the world. So there's really no shortage of things to explore, uh, both theologically, spiritually, and in terms of good works, which is the flower of all those things. Are, are you a student or are you? No, you're youthful, so I didn't mean to no, imply you're. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but when you, when you what, what's behind your question when you say, what should I do? Uh, I don't think the Council Fathers said, well, how are you going to implement Gaudium et Spes as much as it informs your, your worldview and how you regard Jesus Christ. And then the, the expected things kick in. Uh, so living a virtuous life, uh, being, uh, again, I don't know your circumstances, but whatever they are, at work, uh, being someone at work who's not only just a good worker, but is helpful to others in their work. So any, you, know, you pick a state of life, the, the duties, responsibilities, and opportunities emerge from that. So yes, Melanie. Sure, so there's a concept in Vatican II that also John Paul II develops particularly when he's talking about marriage and family life and, and human sexuality of self-gift, that my, from a, a spiritual point of view, frankly, that my vocation is to love. The fundamental vocation of every human being is to love. Christ is emblematic of that by dying and rising on the cross for us. And so the idea of self-gift is that I offer, I am truly myself, not by nihilism or negation or rejecting my body or rejecting society. Rather, I am truly myself when I give myself away to others in service, whatever my circumstance is. In the case of marriage, the philosophy, theology, spirituality of self-gift is many things in marriage and in the arena of human sexuality it'll form the basis for self-gift means giving all of myself in sexuality both love and the possibility of life so it self-gift is tied to my vocation to love which is my core vocation that Christ reveals to me in the inmost recesses of my being right it's not a question by you just saying it's a question <laughs> At least lilt your voice up like a Canadian and fake it. But okay, now all the way in the back. Yeah. Well, Vatican I was an abbreviated council, John, uh, that had to end early due to the Franco-Prussian War, and it was only able to establish uh, documents on papal infallibility and, and some other things related to the church. Uh, and the point I made in class one is because that council ended early, it, we, we, we lived through a, a lopsided view of what the church is, what I would call a kind of abbreviated view, namely the Pope. And so uh, the, the, the example I use is the Pope you know, has a suitcase and tradition is in it and he walks around and tells us what's in the suitcase and that bishops throughout the world are just the office boys of the Pope. What Vatican II, the ambition was, is we are a universal church and we are going to retrieve from our history, from the fathers of the church and others, our broader message. We've got a very good message to tell the world. One of those was collegiality of the bishops with the Pope. Uh, they're not just the office boys of the Pope. Another one was the universal mission we all have to holiness not just for religious, not just for clergy, all of us. The fact that this had to be explained uh, tells you a lot about uh, how people regarded holiness. Uh, I'm not saying this in absolute terms, but the ethos of the church was true holiness is for priests and religious. I can remember little old me when I was a seminarian in Humboldt Park learning Spanish living with a family from Guatemala and going to school at the parish by day to learn Spanish. They couldn't believe that I had to use the bathroom. Uh, I'm not making this up. They were so devotional and pietistic. Uh, maybe it was the food they were serving me. I had to, but uh, my point is that I was put on a pedestal uh, 
beyond all proportion uh, because they thought that was inappropriate. They'd all kind of go to the other side of the house uh, and um, it was like a solemn moment and it, it was awkward, of course. Um, they still didn't provide warm water for the showers that father could put up with, but uh, I'm kidding. Uh, but there's this putting clergy on a pedestal to the point of royalty. You look at the popes wearing tiaras and being hoisted in you know, with pallbearers except they're upright. Uh, this goes back to you know, regal and regalia of 19th, 18th, 17th. It's, it it kind of is absurd if you think about it. Uh, so uh, Vatican I had some very good things to say, uh, but it's receding in the rearview mirror, quite frankly, whereas Trent is not. But Vatican I is because it was an abbreviated council which only said one or two things of significance. Is that helpful? There is an interesting book written by Monsignor George Kelly. It came out uh, in the late 70s called The Battle for the American Church. And in that, he has a chapter on where this really, the rubber hit the road with the bishops and culture and society. And it was in the fight over Humanae Vitae. The, the papal encyclical of Paul VI on uh, artificial birth control or contraceptives. And what emerged out of that battle was largely a battle within the church, clergy. If you surveyed Catholics in 1960, well over 75, 80% of married couples agreed with the church's teaching on not using artificial birth control. Well over 75, 80%. Well over 75-80% of, of Catholic students in college waited until marriage to have sex. What happened was not so much the laity changed initially, although that was happening in culture. It's the priests and theologians started debating this because Paul VI starts that papal commission. I'll, I'll get to you know this. The, the answer in 1964 and waited four years until 1968 to publish Humanae Vitae. That allowed four years of dissent to start to arise uh, and the chaos starts with the schools. I, I mentioned this in class one. Uh, heads of universities, the Land O'Lake Statement of 1967, start to find autonomy from the Catholic Church in curricula, selection of professors, they have to be Catholic. Uh, all of that starts in the 60s, in the late 60s. What emerges out of this then with how fumbled that teaching was, was the rise of conscience rights, so-called. And that ultimately the position that emerged with the bishops fighting this out, and many did fight uh, with their priests uh, on teaching this, that uh, this teaching is what the church teaches, and if your conscience cannot embrace it, uh, stay in touch with us, but live your life as best you can. By creating that form of management, uh, it created a vacuum between church leaders and culture and society. Namely, this is what the church teaches, but if your conscience cannot embrace it, then that's the end of the discussion. And so that created habits in the leadership. What were the habits? The habits were be clear on what the church teaches when you talk about it, but conscience prevails. And so that created habits of not engaging the questions anymore. They got you know, tired of it. You know, what's the point? And so in attitudinal surveys by 1967, 68, it had flipped where 30% of Catholics who were married uh, thought using artificial birth control was wrong. 70% and no problem. Why? Because their priest told them so. That conscience dictates. Absolutely. And so this starts to grow up. By the 1969-1970, it, it was over. There was a kind of truce with society that the bishops embraced, an accommodation. Uh, a let's play the long game with society. You know, if we come at with judgments and attacks, uh, we'll lose more people, etc., etc., etc. That thinking has proved to have been misguided, as we've seen.
to say the least. But I think Monsignor Kelly locates the source of the problem by the habits that were formed coming out of Humanae Vitae, which was the flashpoint. The dissent started, uh, conscience rights were, were talked about in a way that were incorrect. Uh, conscience is not an absolute arbiter. It's a subjective absolute arbiter, but not an objective. You are still obliged to inform your conscience just as much as you are to follow your conscience. That second part was never discussed. So to summarize then, bishops to get along uh, took this kind of hands-off posture. And they spiritually weren't prepared for the rebellion amongst clergy. And I don't understand this. Uh, th imagine running a business this way. We talked about in class one, if you were running an automotive facility and your executive team does massive amounts of research about what cars people want, the, the analogy will break down shortly. But, and they determine, hey, we want two door and four door in the colors of red, blue, and white. And the local plant managers and hourly people say, you know what, we're not going to build that. We're, we're going to make them fuchsia with polka dots and AM radios only especially under bridges. No business could operate that way, right? But for some reason, the bishops thought it was 1955 or something. They thought, well, I can't get rid of priests. I, ha I have 500 parishes I have to keep open. So the commitment was to the infrastructure, keeping things open, keeping things going at the expense of evangelization to a corrupt culture. And so you do that by remaining silent and standoffish and arm's length. And that's precisely what they did. And how do I know that? Because I've talked to some of them. That's exactly what they did. Let's take the long view. Let's accompany. So now we're hearing refried beans from the 1960s and 70s. I mean, it, everything comes full circle. I mean, the, yes. National Socialism, which is what the Nazi Party was, is a left-wing ideology, as, and I define left-wing ideology as the state assumes the provinces of all means of production and destroys natural communities and the principle of subsidiarity that a lower part can do what the higher part should not do. Any nationalistic scheme, which is uh, race-based, whereas Marxism is class-based, still uses the state as the jackboot on the broader society. So you'd never see a, uh, a, you know, the National Socialists allowed the church to exist, so it has the hue of being right-wing, but it, it crushed the church where it could. Uh, so uh, the church was so opposed to communism uh, that it, it it tended to associate more than it should have with fascist movements. That doesn't make fascist movements right-wing. Uh, they're left-wing because the state is all, all for the state, all in the state, all by the state. So in our common parlance, people have tried to, in the continuum of political ideology, move fascism from its left-wing origins. It's just what's your... What's your metric? Is it class or race? I'm still going to socialize everything else and try to locate it on the right to discredit the right. But Ayn Rand never said <laughs> you have to share your property with, uh, I mean, it's absurd. So National Socialism, I mean, they're not reading uh, The Fountainhead in the, uh, in the book clubs. Of, so uh, maybe they are in the... Uh, story hours with people who wear costumes, but, um, <laughs> but um, you, you see what I'm getting at? The, uh, leftism, the they're, they're leftism is collectivism. One is wearing the uniform of races and the other is wearing the uniform right. of class. What's the difference to the person in the street if they're taking my home and asking me what do I believe? Right. You see what I mean? But, but, but liberal elites want to associate uh, Nazism with a right-wing ideology, which and it's it's patently absurd. Say, so I hope this was useful, helpful. Thank you, and we'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>